All right. Good evening. I'm glad you're here. Let's start with a prayer. All right. Let's bow together. God in heaven, we uh, so thankful for uh, the summertime and change of pace and uh, warm weather, and we just uh, just thank you for the seasons. God, especially though, we, we thank you for Jesus, and we just pray this this evening that we can um, praise you and and remember your son, and help us to um, praise you with all of our mind and our heart and our strength, and God, we just uh, help us to take that praise with us this week as we go out and, and deal with other people, and just help us to uh, be yours. God, help us to raise our voices in song now and help us to reflect on you and lift up each other. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> I don't remember the beginning of the song. It's a good one. Well, it's a good song. I'm sure. I think, I think on Mondays, Mondays we usually sit sometimes like it's just this like whole, whole week, week away almost. Like, oh, okay, okay, well, come on now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Our God is an awesome God. He raised from heaven a one with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an
Anybody else? No? All right. Kate, what would you like to say? A, B, C, D? Okay. You know that song? All right, you ready? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Jesus, calm the stormy sea. A, I, J, K, L, M, N. Jesus is my loyal friend. O, B, Q, R, S, T, U. I believe the Bible's true. The end of you, God's promise you. X, Y, Z, to watch you carefully. Good job. Drink and grow. All right. Ready? Don't read your Bible. Don't pray every day. You'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And then you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And then you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. Don't read your Bible. Don't pray every day. You'll shrink, shrink, shrink. But read your Bible and pray every day. You'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible and pray every day. You'll grow, grow, grow. Very good. That'll be great. You ready to go back? Let's go back. All right. Oh, you know. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9 tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 9. About, I guess it was Tuesday. I was uh, sitting at my computer and got an email. And uh, it said five weeks until Sooner Youth Camp, which seems really, really close <laughs> to me. Um, but I was I was thinking about sooner. Um, we finished up curriculum and are getting teachers prepared to go. And uh, and actually, about ten years ago, we put together a, a five week series on grace, and that's what I decided to do. And so the email came, and I was already thinking about sooner. We sang "My God and I" uh, this morning, and so uh, just sort of reminiscent today of all things sooner. But we're going to spend five weeks from now until until sooner, talking about uh, the idea of grace, which is a picture of God's heart, and it's a transformer of, of our lives. We talk about transformation and what it is that changes us, what it is that transforms us as the people of God. And central to faith in, in any situation is the idea of grace, the reality of grace, what it is that God does in the life of man. It is one of the most simple concepts, I think, biblically, when looked at in one direction, that is God provides all that we need for life and for godliness. God provides a way of salvation. God provides a home with him through eternity. We talked this morning. Um, and And in, in that sense, grace is, is a known entity. In another sense, one of the things that I have found throughout the course of ministry is a large number of people struggle with the idea of grace. They struggle with the idea that God will do exactly what God says he will do. Not, not in the sense that they doubt God, but in the sense that we are raised in and live in a culture that um, values independence, that values the ability to sort of do it yourself, that values hard work, all of which I think are good biblical principles in terms of 
how we we walk through life that we are to be a people who work that we are to be a people who are self-responsible that we are are we take responsibility on ourselves that we uh, are a people who who do work it is it is part of what god has placed on man at the time that he left the garden and this this understanding that work is a, a part a, a domineering part a dominating part of our life uh, work was was in the garden itself, and in that place, I think it had a, a better balance, a better understanding. Um, in terms of leaving the garden, it became this idea of toil, this idea of um, struggle, but people continue to struggle with that. Which part is my part, and which part is God's part? And e even the language of that bothers me, because in order for grace to be a gift, it has to be God's part, that God is the one who does. But do we not have a place in a relationship with God? Do we not have a responsibility to God? We do have a responsibility. We do have a place in this relationship, and that is to be a people who follow where God leads, a people who believe what God tells us, that we live a life that reflects the work of God in our lives, that what work we do, we do based on the nature and character of God. In John chapter 6, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I want you to do the work that I give you, and the work that I give you is this, that you believe. And we look at a definition like that and go, well, that's not much work. I've believed for a long time, and yet it is sometimes some work to believe that God would be so generous, to believe that God would be so loving when we understand our own shortcomings or we understand our own struggles or understand our own limitations, to, to deal with this understanding of what grace is and what grace does and this expression of God's love, um, it, it tells us something about who God is. And it's important for us to be people who understand what it is that grace does and how it is that grace accomplishes what it is that God sets out to do. We start by just really dealing with a simple definition. What is grace? The most simple definition is grace is a gift. And I think that that is a good definition. We could could talk about this idea of a gift and what this gift entails or what this gift does in our lives but but in, in reality, that is the definition of what grace is. Grace is a gift. I am blessed with really good parents, and um, and I value uh, who they are the, old, the older that I get. Um, my, uh, my parents have great traits and great qualities. One of, the, one of the things that really is neat about my mother is that my mother is a great gift giver. And in terms of my mother gets things that are appropriate to the person she's getting them for, you know, if you're, if any of you are in our situation, you have, you have birthday parties, six and seven year old birthday parties, four and five year old birthday parties, 50 year old birthday parties. And sometimes you go to the store to get a gift and you have sort of a number in mind. What am I going to buy a six-year-old? We're going to buy something that's twenty dollars. So what we're going to get? They're not going to get anything more than that. It's going to get, and we we are guided in our gift giving at times by by criteria that don't necessarily have anything to do with the other person. Robin gets a whole slew of gifts at the end of every year. Her kids love her. Her kids honor her, but very rarely does she get anything that actually fits who she is. We get a lot of Starbucks cards, which I enjoy because Robin doesn't drink coffee and I do. And so I, mean, I value her work over the year and the bonus that I get at the end of her school teaching. She gets a lot of soap that she that's really florally and Robin's not a floral scent kind of a person. She's very much a fruit scent kind of a person. Uh, and those, those show up every once in a while, but not very often. And, um, and so you know, it's 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 funny. Gift giving is really an art to be able to give a gift that is appropriate to someone. And and like I said, my my mom is is really good at that. So we're aware of that. We anticipate things that come from mom. We anticipate what it is that she's getting. Christmas is fun because we you know you just kind of know it's. And what she gives you is something that you value. 
It's something that you hang on to. It's something that you fall in love with because she knows who you are. It's something that you keep. It's something that you continue to use because she, she bought it for that very specific thing. In the best sense, gifts change our lives. They change our way of thinking. They, they bring about the best in us. That when somebody knows you and gives you a gift, it's something that you cherish and something that you hang on to. I have a box of old gifts that I have worn out in, in my life, gifts that I got from people who knew who I was and who, who gave me something as simple as a keychain, as simple as something, something but, but I used for years and, and years and years. And you look at that box every once in a while and you remember the people and you remember that relationship. Well, grace in terms of what it is that God does is that way. God is the best gift giver. And the gifts that God gives us change our life, change who we are and what we are about and what we do. They change how we think and how we act, and they change how we live. Um, gifts are meant to do that. When we talk about the grace of God, we understand this idea that grace is, at its very heart, transformative. It changes the relationship that we had with God before we received grace. It changes the way our hearts function, the way our minds function after we have received grace. Why do we need grace in terms of this transformation that we talk about? We need grace on the very basic level because we are broken by sin. And, and it is in this understanding that we value what it is that God does. Um, we talk about being broken by sin, I, and I sometimes wonder if we understand the depth of that particular statement. When, when Adam and Eve sinned in, in, and fell in Genesis 2 and 3, we, we have in our minds the fact that they did something wrong, they ate of a specific fruit, and so they got kicked out because they ate fruit. And yet in that passage, if we believe again what it is that Paul tells us about sin, it is not simply the eating of fruit. It is the rejection of the will of God. It's the rejection of the person of God. It is the rejection of the heart of God. That Eve believed a lie in when she knew better. That she decided to view God not through the, the standard that God had given them, but through the words of the serpent, that she decided to bring something else into the equation. And, and Adam decided to follow. And so we talk about them leaving the garden. It is a natural consequence for what happened. When we talk about famine in the land of Israel in the Old Testament, we oftentimes see that famine or drought comes when there is spiritual dryness in the life of the people when the people are not seeking after God, when they are nourished by things other than what God provides, the land echoes what it is that goes on in their hearts. The exit from Eden is an echo of what has already happened in their hearts. They have exited from this relationship with God in pursuit of something else. We do the same thing. Paul tells us that Every man sins and falls short of the glory of God. And then he's very upfront to say the wages of that sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Why do we need grace? Because we are broken. Because the wages of our own labor, because the wages of our own action, because all that we could ever earn is death. People will question, how can a loving God send people to hell? The reality is, it doesn't. The reality is, all of us are bound to that place entirely on our own. Because of our own sin. Because of our own decision. Because of what we do. It is, it is the natural place for us to end up. It is the natural place for us to go. The fact that there is any option at all is due to the great love of God. 
and grace flows from that great love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Again, the gift flows from the love that God has for us. And we're familiar with that picture. And so as a broken people, we need a path to God. We need a chance not to earn something, but a chance simply to live in the presence of God. We talk often about grace and mercy, and they are paired in the Bible in a, in a lot of ways. Grace and mercy show us the pursuit of God. If you're familiar with Psalm 23, it, it ends in that last place with, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Those are characteristics of God. Those are a part of who God is. And the psalmist in that place, David, writes, this is God's pursuit of me all of my days, that God chases after me, that grace and mercy are often paired together because of what it is that God does. Mercy is defined as not getting what we deserve. If we are broken and the wages of sin is death, what do we deserve? We deserve death. In God's great mercy, he says, you don't have to fear death. In the same book, the book of Romans, Paul will write, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? And he talks about the fact that it is swallowed up in something. See, God takes away the sting of death. God takes away the fear of what comes next. God takes away what it is that we would give into naturally. But more than that, in God's great mercy, God also provides grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. And so that's a bit of an expansion on our original definition. That not only does God withhold this, this penalty of lostness from those that are his, God offers a life with him from now through eternity. It is the greatest gift. It is the gift that we need. That we understand that fear and shame and, and all of those things that come with sin are supposed to be swallowed up in the promise of God. When we struggle with what is my part, we forget that that is supposed to be swallowed up in who Christ is. That Jesus takes care of that. That our lives are not about earning, our lives are about responding. Our lives are not about gaining, our lives are about growing. Our lives are not about what we can grab hold of and sort of work and shape and manipulate. Our lives are about transformation in the hands of a master potter. And this grace allows that transformation to take place. This grace is God's heart at work in our lives. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, we have this wonderful picture of grace um, and how grace works its way through our lives and works its way in, in our lives as, as God does this. We are at a time when David, King David, has <clears throat> become king in, in reality. We look at David's life, and there's a lot of time that David spends in the wilderness under the promise of being king, and that he deals with the family of Saul and Jonathan uh, in the sense that I will, I will wait until God makes a move. You know, there's the, there's the whole time when David will not take the life of Saul because David will not take the life of God's anointed. David understands that God is in charge of his people. And and so David's not going to make a, a move there. And his relationship with Saul, while there is very much sort of an animosity there, that Saul seeks to kill David, David seeks to honor God in his relationship with Saul, not to move outside of the will of God, that, that he will sit back and wait for God to open a door, to sit back and wait for God to do what it is that God does. Uh, when David stands in front of Saul and proclaims about Goliath, the battle belongs to the Lord, it is a good indication of the way that David lives. David is ready to step into battle when God opens the door to battle. But David understands that the battle in any situation belongs to the Lord. And that is hard for us to wait on God at times. 
David is really pretty good at it most of the time. He's got his moments. Every man sins and falls short of the glory of God. Um, and so, so we understand that. Um, but David now has waited. God has removed Saul from the throne, and Saul's life is gone. Saul's son, Jonathan, who was knit closely to David, who shared a friendship with David that was that was close, that the best friends, they were comrades, they were brothers in, in all but blood, is also dead. And in 2 Samuel 9, we see David in terms of thinking about that relationship and thinking about his friend, and I think in, in a certain sense thinking about Saul and what it is that God has done and and realizing that that he sits in a palace because God has moved, that he sits in a place of leadership because of what it is that God has done, that he sleeps in the bed he sleeps in, that he leads the people that he leads because God has moved in that place. And as a recipient of God's grace, David responds to that grace. And I think he responds very appropriately. Verse 1, David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David, having received grace, now wishes to bestow grace. And he shows us that grace always begins with God. That grace is something that is reflected in our lives, but it always begins by understanding what it is that God has done. As David reaches this place in his life, as he looks around and sees all that God has blessed him with, as he sees all that God has done, he is moved to respond in such a way that he reaches out in the same way that God has. When David was in the wilderness and David was surrounded by folks who wanted him to take charge, who wanted him to take Saul, who wanted him, David often stood very much alone, but he stood in that place going, I will honor God and let God move first. And only as God opened the doors does he, does he walk through that. And yet it is the same David who could feel so alone, who says, Yea, though I walk through the deepest, darkest valley, I shall fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. David understands God's presence in those places and sees that as a grace. And so David begins to live a life that is in kind, that he responds to that. David offers life when we deserve death because God offers life when we deserve death. David, who would have experienced God, who is the giver of life, looks around now and says, can I show a kindness to the house of Saul on account of my friend Jonathan? He understands that to do a kindness for Jonathan is to do a kindness for Saul. And he is willing to do that for someone who held him as an enemy, for someone who pursued him, for someone who made life difficult for him for years, David has experienced such a sense of grace that he is willing to bestow that grace on the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake. Verse 2, now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amuel of Lodeber, at Lodeber. Then king David sent and brought him from the house of Maker, the son of Amuel, to Lodeber. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And we're going to stop there. David looks around and says, what can I do? Can I offer life to someone? Can I offer something different, a kindness for the sake of Jonathan? He goes into his court and he says, does anyone know? And Zeba's the one that stands up and says, I, I know. Zeba's the one that's been called. Now, in the political system of the world at this particular time, it is not a smart thing to be 
the descendant of someone who used to be king. Okay? David sits on the throne, and we understand from our vantage point that he sits there because God has moved, because God has placed him there, because this is the plan of God. In the eyes of the world around him, it probably looks very much like David sits on the throne because he overthrew the former king. He could stand being accused of something he did not do, but that's the way that it worked. Usurpers took power, and No king just sort of hands it over to somebody else very often. I mean, it's happened in history a time or two, but it has shocked the world when it has happened. And and David, in fitting in the ordinary of the time, very likely is considered someone who has taken the throne for himself. And so for David to come now and say, is there anybody left of the house of Saul? In the minds of people of the time is to say, is there anybody left that I need to kill so that there are no survivors left who would come and claim the throne that is mine. See, that's what a normal king would do. That's what a normal king would seek, to put to death those who could take his throne. Herod the Great killed his own children in order to protect his own power. This is not something that's not a commonplace occurrence for thousands of years of humanity's history, that folks protect the throne on which they sit at the expense of the life of those who have gone before who may have some sort of a claim somewhere else. Ziba comes and says, there is one. And David goes, where is he? Well, maker, he's at Lodeber is where he's at. And it's a faraway place. That's what Lodeber means. It means emptiness, desolation. He lives way out in the country where you can't find him. He lives in a place that you wouldn't normally go. It is beyond the last gas station in Arizona. It is it is in the middle of dry country. It is not a place that a king wants to be. It is not something that you would want to go and find. It is Lodeber. It is a wasteland. It is a place that is barren. This is where Mephibosheth lives. On the night when his father and his grandfather died. There was panic in the place where Mephibosheth and his nursemaid were. And his nursemaid picked him up and prepared to escape with him. And as she ran, she fell and she broke both of his legs. And Mephibosheth never walked right again. He is lame in both of his feet. And so here is someone who would have been, could have been king who from the time he is a child doesn't have anything that a king has. He doesn't have a palace. He doesn't have a fancy table. He doesn't have a slew of servants. He doesn't have an army that he can lead. He doesn't have authority or power. He doesn't have position. He lives in a wasteland. He lives in a place that he can't even walk his own fields because of the condition of his body. He lives in a place where the fields aren't worth walking because it's too dry and it's too arid and it's too dusty. It's too empty. It is a desolation. It is an empty place. It is Lodeber. And David says, go get him. And you you think you can imagine the scene. What happens when you see army officers ride up to your door and you are the son, the grandson of a former king? And you recognize that they are soldiers of the current king. See, Mephibosheth was hurt once when they thought that was going to happen. Now it's a reality. Where is the fear? Where is the sting of death? Where is the concern for what might happen? Is Mephibosheth afraid? He is afraid. The text will tell us he's afraid. But he has to go with these soldiers who come and who take him. And where do they take him? They take him to a place that should have been his. They take him to a place that he was meant to be, that he was meant to live in. They take him to the palace and they bring him before David. And Mephibosheth's response is to fall down and to say, what would you want from me, right? He fell on his face, verse 8. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. 
probably not just the standard answer. Probably a sign of surrender. I am not your enemy. I cannot lead men in battle. I cannot offer resistance. I am broken in body. I am broken in spirit. I belong in the wasteland in Lodiber. I am here because I am your servant, not because I am your enemy, not because I am your foe, right? I am your servant. And David, verse 7, said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as he? See, David offers life when all that Mephibosheth has experienced is death. When his hopes have died, when his future is gone, when his body is is broken and there's nothing left, David comes and says, let me give you a new place, a new life, a new home. You shall live here in the palace with me. You shall eat at the king's table. You shall have your fill of the best that there is. It is an amazing offer, but it is an offer that Mephibosheth cannot believe. Why would you, the king, offer such a thing to a dead dog such as I? In the midst of the greatest gift that Mephibosheth could see in his life, the only thing that he can notice is, I am not worthy. It is a trap. It can't be real. In this place, I am no better than a dead dog. And what place does a dead dog have in palaces? That's the question that he asks. What what place does a dead dog have in palaces? I am of no use. I am I am no good. I cannot guard. I cannot attack. I cannot warn. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. That defines and limits Mephibosheth's life. And he understands that as he talks to David. Then the king called Ziba, verse 9, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till till the land for him and shall bring uh, in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. The the dead dog picture still there. What, What can I do? The answer to that is you can do nothing. It is not about what you can do for me. It's about what I will do for you. I will take the servant of your grandfather who understands palace life and understands what it is to serve a king. And he and his servants will go out and they will till the lands that I'm going to give you back. Lands that are not located in the wasteland, but lands that are fertile. Lands that belong to a king. Lands that will produce so that you can eat. Lands that will produce things that you cannot imagine. But they are things that you don't have to worry about because you will eat here at the king's table. You will be here in the place of abundance. You no longer belong in Lodiber. You belong in the palace. You belong at my table. You are one of my sons. And you will be treated that way. For Mephibosheth, this is a move up the ladder. His first connection was his grandson to a king. But now David says, I will treat you as one of my own sons. And you will not have want for anything. But Mephibosheth has to believe him. Mephibosheth has to surrender to what it is that David is offering. And so Mephibosheth eats at the table of David. And can you imagine the first time that he comes in? Is he on crutches? Or does he have to be carried? He doesn't come in himself. He has to have some sort of help. But there at the table sit David's wives and his children. There is Absalom with his long flowing hair. There is Joab, the commander of the armies. 
there is Micah, who is kin to Mephibosheth. There are people here that, that are, are the stuff of legends in their own time. He sits at the place where the giant slayer sits. He, he sits at the place where the leaders of armies and the rulers of nations sit. It is nothing like where he's been before. Where he's been before has been meager. Where he's at now is abundant. Where he's at now is something entirely different. The first time he comes in, how odd must he be? The second time he comes in, how odd must he be? But what about week three or week four? You know, a new baby is great. First week. <laughs> They're great all the time. But eventually you get tired, don't you? Eventually things wear off. Eventually it becomes normal. And eventually it's going to have to be that way for Mephibosheth too, isn't it? That over time, this thing that is new, this thing that is shiny, this thing that is bright, becomes comfortable. It becomes a natural part of his life. It becomes what he does and who he is. That doesn't mean that there are not moments where he goes, this is fantastic. But this relationship as it grows shapes who he is and how he thinks. The more often he comes into the king's table, the more comfortable he is with the king. The more often he comes into the king's family, the more part of the family he is. The more he sits in that place, the more he is transformed, the more he is changed. His trust comes a little at a time, but it comes. See, grace changes the story of Mephibosheth. Who are you? I am Mephibosheth. Where do you live? I live in the king's palace. I eat at the king's table. I sit with the king's family. I'm a part of that family. I am someone who has been blessed because of the kindness of David. His story has changed. The power in 2 Samuel 9 is pretty cool because of the story of Mephibosheth. Verse 13, So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Why did you have to throw that in? Right? Why did you have to put the last part in? Because Mephibosheth was still broken. That didn't change. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth still couldn't carry himself. He can't walk unaided. He's got to have some sort of help. Crutches, people, whatever it is. But there's still that that's in his life. Right? Mephibosheth's story is our story. It is the story of a king who comes and says, for the sake of love, let me show you a kindness. Let me show you what I am all about. That king is God, who says, I will move in your life. And what he offers is he offers life instead of death. This is the gift of grace. It is a place where the king comes and says, will you eat at my table? Will you live in my palace? Because the invitation is open to you to come and to be in this place, to come and to be near me, to leave behind want and enter into a place of abundance, to leave behind the wasteland and to enter into the place of riches. It takes us a while to get used to it. But over time, when we accept that invitation, we are changed that we come to have a certain number of expectations about what it means to be a part of God's family, that we have expectations about the fact that God answers when we speak, that God listens when we ask, that God moves when we're in need. It takes time, and that time never changes, but we become part of something that becomes a part of us, that transforms who we are, that transforms how we think and how we live and how we feel. That's what the church does. I think sometimes we miss the imagery when we come together. We come to this place at the invitation of a king. We're invited to sit at a table where we have everything we would ever need in our lives. 
we sit with the king's family who are part of who we are, and you're impressive. You're a part of who we are, and we walk through life together. This is the great gift of God that we have through Jesus Christ. Will we come and trust what it is that God tells us, what it is that God teaches us? Here's what God says. I have loved you so much that I have given you my son that if you will believe, you will have everlasting life. You will sit and eat always at the king's table. Mephibosheth is not from Jerusalem, or from Lodiber anymore. That last verse says he's from Jerusalem. That last place says he's in a king's palace. But am I worthy? Can I believe it? Why does the writer put, now he was laying in both of his feet? Because we will always struggle with sin. Every man sins and falls short of the glory of God. Does that stop us from eating at the Lord's table? Does that stop us from being a part of his family? Does that stop us from trusting the invitation? Not in any way. Not in any way. I can't imagine that whatever Mephibosheth used in Lodeber, David improved on in the palace. That what help he needed, Mephibosheth got. That what aid was required, David moved to make sure he had everything that would take for life to be something worth living. That's the invitation of God, is to come and live a life worth living. To come to this place and receive a gift, a gift of relationship, a gift of family, a gift of purpose. Come and receive a gift of love, a gift of transformation. Come and be changed. So we offer that invitation tonight. In the same way that God has offered that invitation to man, in the same way that David offered that invitation to Mephibosheth, we offer you a chance to come and to be a part of a different story. The story of a king who invites us who are broken to sit at his table. I invite you to come now as we stand and as we sing. God is so That's good to see everybody. It's working? Yeah, I can hear it now. You know it's not working too good when I can't hear it. Good to see everybody again this evening. Bill, thanks for the lesson on grace. It is comforting, isn't it, to know that we, when we are spiritually crippled in both feet, the king says, come eat with me. And that's where we're at. Eating with the king of the world, the power of the universe. And that's good news. I don't have anything special to announce. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Need to read your bulletin. <clears throat> Get your little prayer list. Take it home with you because there's a few people extra so that uh, we can pray for them several times a day. Mine's most of the time at meals. So you... Yes.
Johnny Dunnigan, whatever, passed away. So we need to keep his family in our prayers. If I don't write that down, I got more than a, three seconds. It'll be gone. Here it is. All right, so when we go throughout our week, getting prepared to come back Wednesday and for a little pick-me-up and then come back next Sunday, let's all uh, distribute grace towards each other, especially ourselves, so that we can know and have comfort in our own salvation and distribute grace to the people that we don't know. So let's have a prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, we, we're just so mindful of your power, your greatness, your love. We're mindful of it even if we can't understand all you are. Father, we're grateful for the fact that despite our frailness and weakness, whether it be physical body or in our spiritual shape, and when we turn look at you, and come to you in prayer. You're there with us. You protect us, guide us, and help us every day in our life. Father, we pray that you be with the family of, of John Dungan, uh, who, who just passed away. We just pray that you'll continually be with them and help them and the things as they as they mourn their loss, Father, we we be with we pray that you'll be with all the members and all the uh, people that have that are still mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for Lacey Bernard as she still struggles, and Joe and Olita and uh, Lynette and Norman, and Father, just there are just so many Vicky, and we pray for the success and the. Of many of the treatments, we pray for Kathleen Gardner. We, get, you know, Father, there, and this list goes on and on, and and they're in the uh, Trish McDonald, uh, Stacy Van Horn. Father, we're just grateful that we have this avenue of prayer that you will answer. Father, we bring again the students, the families, and the teachers that lost their life in Uvalde needlessly. And the family that just as well lost their life because a, a criminal got loose and killed them for their car. An old pickup truck. What a way to go. Thank you, Father. Be with their family. Watch us this week. Help us. Provide for us. Give us strength to overcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.